morning and welcome to this week's Sticks Radio Show here on Seclo Sounds. And my guest today is none other than the Moody Blues guitarist, John Lodge. He's going to be talking about his career before the Moody Blues, the Moody Blues, and about his brand new album, uh, 10,000 Night Years Ago. He's going to be talking about that during the show. And also later on in the show, we'll be doing the events and theatre shows in and around Milton Keynes. But before we talk to John, let's play a track from the uh, 10,000 Night Years Ago album. This is a song called Get Me Out of Here. Say that'll make you change your mind Walking in this cold and lonely room Heaven only knows what lies and waits outside your door But I guess I'm gonna find out real soon Okay, that was uh, Get Me Out of Here from the new album 10,000 Light Years Ago. And that's what from my guest today, none other than John Lodge of the Moody Blues. Good morning, John. Hey, how are we doing? I'm doing great. That is a great song, isn't it? Thank you. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, it's, great. It? it's great to do on stage as well, you know, the reception. I, I bet it is. Been fantastic. It's it's uh, listening to the album. I, I've got the album and I've been listening to it. I've listened to it three times, I think, now. Uh, it's very different from the Moody Blues stuff. Yeah, it, it's it's probably the, an extension of me within the Moody Blues. You know, mm. um, um, I, I, I like the big dramatic uh, type of songs, you know, like, mm. uh, I suppose, like, Isn't Life Strange and uh, um, 
uh, sort of singer in a rock and roll band, and you know, I love all the big um, anthem type songs. Yeah, this... and uh, you know, so within the Moody's, of course, uh, we've got a few of them like that, like Stepping in Slide Zone, and uh, but uh, that's what I really wanted to do on this album. I wanted to. Uh, uh, particularly with the, you know, the return of vinyl. That's what intrigued me, of course, from the beginning, because vinyl may, is making a great comeback at 180 gram, and you can get full frequency on 180 gram. And I thought, well, that's it. That's exactly what I want to do. I want to yes. get the full frequency sound, you know, mm. um, coming off that vinyl. It's, it's great. Actually, I, I love vinyl. Um, I've still got a lot of my old original vinyl. And, of course, now it's all back. At Christmas, I think it was HMV was selling a turntable every two minutes or something. Something crazy. Yeah, it's incredible. I bought my grandson a turntable. He, he looked at it and he thought, well, where'd you put, where'd you put the record? <laughs> well, I've got a turntable that plugs in the back of uh, my stereo system. Oh. And it's really, really good. And it's also handy because you can actually burn... Your your vinyl down onto onto the your hard drive of your computer or whatever you want to do nowadays, and it I, I love it because it to me vinyl has a bit of soul. It does. I tell you what happened to me the other day when I was uh, out. So just I always casually look round with, it, especially if I'm on the road and I've got a day off somewhere. I'll look round and see what's going on. And I went into uh, a music store, and can you believe they're starting to make radio cramps again? Really? I couldn't believe it. There was this radio gram, brand new, with a beautiful turntable in, oh, and a beautiful digital radio. And uh, it was just really modern, you know, but the speakers, stereo speakers in there and everything. Yeah. And it's a real piece of furniture for the house. I thought, gee, perhaps we're getting back to that as well. Well, retro's, cool. retro's very back, isn't it? Retro music, retro stuff is very yeah. back. Because so, yeah, there's I'm something not... magic about it, you know? Yeah. The big I... problem today, I think, is that uh, you buy, you know, really small bow speakers and one great big sound, but, you know, bass uh, mm. uh, box somewhere you put it. Or do you have some nice speakers put on the wall so you can see them? And what do you do, you know? And uh, um, and the, the retro is like, well, it's all taken care of you for you there. You've got a radiogram. Yeah, that's, that's, I know. Yeah. Do you know, I remember my grandmother having one. God, blimey, that's going back some years. I, I'm regressing now. I'll be back in my childhood in a minute. <laughs> it's great, though. I mean, l- let's talk about how y- your early life before you joined the Moody Blues and the bits and bobs about, if we may. Um, you originally was born in Birmingham, if I'm correct. Yeah, Birmingham, Erdington, England, a little area in Erdington called Birch's Green. And um, it was a development, council house development, I think probably built um, uh, just before the war, because uh, uh, I know the bomb landed on the middle of the uh, the cul-de-sac where we lived, and uh, not that I was there, of course, those days, but <laughs> up to a few of the houses down. So obviously it was bought just before, it was built just before the war, and... Uh, it's a very nice place, you know. I um, um, you, I lived there, grew up there. I actually visited the game last year. Went went back to look at the house I was born in. It was quite interesting to uh, go back and have a look. But uh, you know, I went there and I went to a little local school called Birch's Green, mm-hmm. which was um, in a sort of a temporary uh, school building. You know, one of those prefabricated type with wooden rafters and wooden. Um, corridors that you know with holes in where you dropped your dinner money down the hole and you never saw it again mm-hmm. uh, you know places like that but uh, it was a you know great time but I tell you what was really good for me particularly and I didn't notice at the time was that um, every afternoon at, in junior school it was about seven we used to have a quiet period where they used to play um, classical music you sit down for a half an hour I suppose it's half an hour I can't remember now but uh, and, uh, you know, because Birmingham has got one of the great orchestras, CBSO, and I think just one of the teachers decided it'd be a great idea to have this quiet period where you just listen to music. And um, I think some of that must have got into my psycho somewhere, yeah. And uh, because when I started to really understand rock and roll, uh, all the harmonies that I must have remembered sort of came out and sort of mm. added to the way I write songs. Mm. It's, um, I mean, you obviously, you uh, you left school and you went on to college then, didn't you, to do um, advanced, yep. advanced technology for engineering? I did, yeah. So, sounds very grand. Well, when I was, when I was uh, really young, um, you know, like seven, you know, I, yeah. I was fascinated by cars. I think I drove my first car when I was like seven years of age, you know, mm. and I'm absolutely fascinated by cars, I still am, mm-hmm. and... Um, not the engines, not the engines, but just the design and the whole 
uh, you know, the whole philosophy of cars and the whole um, the whole being of cars. And um, so I wanted to be, uh, when I was about 10 or 11, I wanted to be a car designer. And um, I was fortunate enough to, uh, um, you know, pass that 11 plus. I went to grammar school. And, um, you know, the world opened up for me, to be honest. And I saw lots of things that uh, I don't think I'd ever seen it, but I stayed, you know, in, in where I was born in Purchase Green. Mm. And, um, but unfortunately, the car industry at that time, when I was starting to leave school, was sort of falling apart. And mm. all the great cars, all Austins and Morris's, they, these companies were starting to non-exist, and cars were getting designed in Italy by Pina Farina. And um, I suddenly saw my career as a as a car designer disappearing. But at the same time, when I was 13, I bought my first guitar. So there you go. I became you a, you uh, brought it yourself, or you had it brought for you? I had a, you know, I became a musician. I, I, I carried on with my college until I'd, I'd finished it as well. But every night and every weekend, um, I'd be playing in a band. You know? mm. And I mean, that was when, I mean, I imagine that was what, the early 60s, was it? Uh, late, late, late 50s, 50s, early 60s. And it was sort of, like, I suppose, not the skiffle into the rock and roll era, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I mean, I started off with skiffle. I mean, I learned to play my guitar. I bought my first guitar from a neighbour. Who, whose um, son had just finished national service and came back from Germany with this uh, acoustic steel string guitar. And his mother said to my mother, would your son like to buy this guitar like for two pounds, ten shillings? And uh, I bought it. I had no idea how he played, no idea at all. And I just spent the next however long trying to work out how a guitar worked. And... Um, I started with very basic skiffle chords, you know, uh, all those Lonnie Donegan and Charles McDevitt type songs, <laughs> uh, Freight Train and um, uh, Cotton Fields and things like that, and learned how it worked, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, and then of course, I discovered real rock and roll. Yeah. Have you still got that guitar? No. Shame. No, but I wish I had have done, but... I do have the original guitar I bought when I was 15. Wow. A Harmony Sovereign. And I actually wrote Ryan My Seesaw on that. And I've still got that guitar. It's been locked away somewhere in an archive. But uh, that was a Harmony Sovereign made in Germany. Uh, and that was about £18, I think. So that was a lot of money in those days. So that would have been about, what, 1960 you got that? 19, or oh, no, well, 1956 or something like that. Yeah. That's amazing, isn't it? Long Actually, time ago. I got, yeah, no, it's probably later than that. But, yeah. No. Well, if you were 15, you would have been... Oh, yeah, we've got to work it out, yeah. 1960? Yeah, it was about 1960, I suppose. Yeah, it was about 1960. I, well, I was doing the maths, actually, myself. Yeah. and uh, I, had me, I, had me, I was doing my fingers, actually, so it was all... <laughs> yeah. And it was around that time you met uh, Ray Thomas. Yeah, I met Ray, and um, I think we met on a bus, to be honest. Like, you know, it's a long time ago. And, yeah. Uh, I knew you sang, for some strange reason... I knew he sang a few songs, but I can't think why I knew that, but he, I knew he did. And uh, we started talking, and we said, let's, let's form a, a band together. And uh, we found a guitarist, uh, found an old school friend of mine who had a guitar as well. And, um, and then we, um, we, we knew of a, a drummer who lived by us as well, so we uh, rented a scout hut in, uh, in uh, Pipe Hayes in Erdington, Birmingham. And we started rehearsing, and um, uh, and uh, that was it. Then it was we, we became El Riot and the Rebels. <laughs> <laughs> El Riot and the Rebels. Great name, El, and we used to wear Mexican outfits. Oh no! Yeah, and we actually went to Duns in the centre of Birmingham, and we bought five sombreros. <laughs> Fun. Great stuff. So, how did that from from that group? How did the Moody's get together? And who, whose idea was it called to call yourself the Moody Blues? Okay, what happened was that um, I, you know, I, to be honest, I'm, I'm a bit younger than the other guys, uh, and I was still at college. And um, uh, there was, you remember there was a thing called uh, you know the Liverpool Beat or whatever it was called. I can't remember. Mersey Beat. Mersey Beat. Yeah. And they did all this, and then they came to Birmingham and did auditions for Brombeat, and 